to a cattle truck to tend six wounded men on a journey which lasted over two days. Locked in among the shattered bones, gangrenous flesh, and dying soldiers, Nietzsche manfully did his best. But by the time they arrived at Karlsruhe, he was a broken man himself. He was shipped to hospital, suffering from dysentery and diphtheria. Despite this traumatic experience, within two months Nietzsche was back teaching in Basel. He continued to overload himself with lectures in philosophy as well as philology, and began writing The Birth of Tragedy. This brilliant and highly original analysis of Greek culture contrasts the clear-cut Apollonian element of classical restraint with the darker, instinctual Dionysian forces. According to Nietzsche, the great art of Greek tragedy came from a fusion of these two elements, which was eventually destroyed by the shallow rationalism of Socrates. This was the first time the darker element of Greek culture had been emphasized, and Nietzsche's characterization of it as fundamental proved highly controversial. During the nineteenth century, the classical world was sacred. Its ideals of justice, culture, and democracy appealed to the self-image of the emerging middle classes. No one wanted to hear that this had all been a big mistake. Even more controversial was Nietzsche's frequent use of Wagner and his Music of the Future to illustrate his philosophical arguments. Indeed, he wrote to his publisher, The real aim of this book is to illuminate Richard Wagner, that extraordinary enigma of our time, in his relation to Greek tragedy. Only Wagner managed to combine both the Apollonian and Dionysian elements in the manner of Greek tragedy. This emphasis on the power-filled Dionysian element was to prove an essential part of Nietzsche's later philosophy. No longer could he condone Schopenhauer's Buddhistic negation of the will. Instead, he pitted this Dionysian element against the Christian elements that he considered to have weakened civilization. He understood that most of our impulses are double-edged. Even our so-called better impulses have their dark or degenerate side. Every ideal presupposes love and hate, reverence and contempt. The essential impulse can arise from either the positive or negative side. In his view, Christianity started from the negative. It had taken hold in the Roman Empire as the religion of the oppressed and slaves— this was everywhere evident in its attitude to life. It constantly sought to overcome our more powerful positive instincts. This negation was both conscious in the espousal of asceticism and self-denial, and unconscious with regard to meekness, which he saw as an unconscious expression of resentment, an inversion of aggression by the weak. Likewise, Nietzsche attacked compassion, the repression of true feelings and the sublimation of desire involved in Christianity in favor of a stronger ethic closer to the origins of our feelings. God was dead. The Christian era was finished. At its worst, the twentieth century proved him right. At its best, it showed that many of the better Christian elements do not depend upon a belief in God. Whether or not we now live closer to our basic feelings remains debatable. Wagner was a supreme artist, but he was not up to philosophical thinking of this order. Gradually Nietzsche began to see through Wagner's intellectual disguise. Wagner was a walking ego of great size and intuitive power, but even his love of Schopenhauer was a passing phase, just grist to the mill for his art. Previously, Nietzsche had been willing to overlook certain nastier elements in the Wagner household, such as his anti-Semitism, his overweening arrogance, and his unwillingness to recognize the ability or needs of anyone other than himself. But there were limits. By now Wagner had moved to Bayreuth, where King Ludwig of Bavaria was building him a theatre which would be devoted exclusively to the performance of his operas a project which was to help bankrupt the Bavarian exchequer and contribute to Ludwig being deposed. In 1876, Nietzsche arrived at Bayreuth for the opening performance of Wagner's Ring Cycle, but fell ill, 
almost certainly from psychosomatic causes. The megalomania and high art decadence had all become too much for him, and he had to leave. Two years later, Nietzsche published his collection of aphorisms, Human, All Too Human, which completed the break with Wagner. Nietzsche's praise of French art, his psychological acumen and deflation of romantic pretensions, and his sheer perceptiveness were all too much for Wagner. Worse still, the work contained no unsolicited advertisements for the music of the future. Perhaps more important, this work also succeeded in alienating some of Nietzsche's more genuine philosophical admirers. Ironically, the cause of this was the one reason he is now universally admired, even by those who abhor his philosophy. In this work, Nietzsche began evolving the style that enabled him to become a master of the German language. No mean task of this, with a language such as German, one which has defeated even some of its most esteemed writers. Nietzsche's style had always been clear and combative, his ideas concentrated yet immediately comprehensible. But now he took to writing in aphorisms. Rather than using long-winded argument, he preferred to present his ideas in a series of penetrating insights, swiftly passing from topic to topic. Nietzsche philosophized on the hoof in more ways than one. His best ideas came to him during long walks in the Swiss countryside. He frequently claimed to have been out walking for longer than three hours, despite his frail health though this could well be a projection of the will to power rather than an actual manifestation of it. It has even been claimed that Nietzsche's aphoristic style resulted from his habit of jotting down his thoughts in a notebook while he was on the move. Whatever the cause, this aphoristic habit of Nietzsche's was to result in a style unparalleled throughout Europe during the nineteenth century. This is a large claim, though Nietzsche would certainly have agreed with it. The nineteenth century was an age of great stylists, but with the exception of the French enfant terrible Rambo, no other writer sensed the coming linguistic revolution, one of tenor rather than felicity. In Nietzsche's prose you can hear the coming voice of the twentieth century. This is the language of the future. But all this didn't happen at once. When Nietzsche wrote Human All Too Human, he was only beginning to find his voice. Even his ideas had in many cases yet to find their mark. This work is filled with an amazing range of psychological aperçus. The fantasist denies reality to himself. The liar does so only to others. The mother of excess is not joy, but joylessness. All poets and writers enamoured of the superlative want to do more than they can. A witticism is an epigram on the death of a feeling. But in the end it all becomes too much. His admirers objected that he wasn't writing philosophy, and they were right. This is psychology, though of such quality that a few decades later Freud soon decided against reading any more Nietzsche, for fear he might discover there was nothing left to say on the subject. But the mixture of aphorisms and psychology doesn't make for a coherent, extended work. Beneath the psychological aperçu there was little underlying train of argument to link the aphorisms, so Nietzsche's work was branded as unsystematic. It was never to lose this tag, which is unfair. Because of his aphoristic style he may have appeared unsystematic, but his ideas are as coherent and closely argued as those confined within any of the great philosophic systems. Yet, of course, he was unsystematic, in a sense that his philosophy spelled the end of all systems. Or should have. But there's always someone willing to have a try. At precisely this time Karl Marx was hard at work in the British Museum. Despite its flaws, Human, all too human, marks Nietzsche's emergence as the finest psychologist of his age. Some feat, considering his lack of social experience. He was essentially a solitary bird. In the normally accepted sense he scarcely knew anyone. He had no real friends. Throughout his life he retained a few close admirers, but his self-obsession prevented him from entering into the give and take of true friendship. So how did he acquire such profound psychological knowledge?
Many commentators are of the opinion that Nietzsche's source in this sphere was just one man, Richard Wagner. This is quite possible. Here, indeed, was a rich seam of psychological oddity to be mined. But such commentators tend to overlook the fact that Nietzsche...